Hey everyone, Dan Johnston here. I'm the Jack of All Ministries here to help you make it happen. And today I'm going to give you some basic soundproofing advice. So I decided to make this video because I've been getting a lot of emails and comments from people that are, you know, they just have some basic soundproofing needs. They're not looking to build some perfectly tuned, you know, half a million dollar studio. They just want to know how to, you know, not hear their kids' video games or to not hear the neighbors across the street when they're partying and stuff like that. Pretty simple stuff. And so I wanted to give some very general guidelines of some things that might be helpful to you if you need to either create a more quiet atmosphere or prevent yourself from bothering other people. So before we get into it, there's a couple of disclaimers that I want to make. The first one is this. I know that there is no one-size-fits-all soundproofing solution. Every situation is different, and there's a lot of things you have to consider. Um, and I want to factor that into my method here, but I understand that there is no one-size-fits-all, and so you kind of need to understand that too. Um, but the reality is I do think that for general guidelines that there are some steps that we can take almost universally that will help most people for very simple applications in their home or business or whatever the case might be. Uh, the other thing is that I am not an expert, so don't think that I'm trying to use this video as a way to instruct you how to make some perfectly tuned studio. That's not the approach that I'm taking here. I do have some experience in building studios and hanging around studios, and um, I have some friends that are you know heavily into the industry and things like that. So I do have some background, um, but I, I recognize that I am not an expert. I'm here to get you in a proficient place where you are happy with some results um, and getting you to ask some really important questions to make sure that you don't make a mistake as you approach soundproofing in your home or business or whatever the case might be. All right, so now that I got those disclaimers out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and hop into the process. Basically, you need to ask yourself four questions from the get-go uh, to figure out exactly what you're going to be doing here. The first question is this. What kind of noise are you actually trying to block out or block in? You know, you might be trying to keep noise in, as in like you're building a drum cage and you don't want the drum sounds to get out. Or you're blocking sounds out, as in you're trying to sleep during the day and you don't want to hear the lawnmowers uh, going off across the street. Okay, so what kind of noise are you trying to take care of? That's very important. The second question you need to ask is how much are you willing to spend? Soundproofing is going to cost you something no matter what you do. Now, odds are, if you're looking at this, you're not planning on paying someone to come in and do some kind of crazy work. Uh, maybe you are willing to pay a little bit, but you, know, you can definitely get some sweat equity out of this as well. So the question is, how much are you willing to do and how much are you willing to pay to make it happen? And that largely depends on the answer to your third question, which is how quiet do you need things to be? If you plan on building a home theater where you're going to be watching movies at 100 decibels, and you expect someone to be in the next room and not hear a whisper, um, it's going to cost you a lot of work and a lot of money. But if it's like, you know what, I just need to cut it you know, to half of what it is now, it may be a little bit easier to achieve. Maybe you just want to cut the edge off. Um, so that's really important to establish as well. And that leads us to our fourth question, which is how much are you willing to sacrifice in terms of the room itself? If you're going to be adding anything to the room, it's going to take up some real estate. Even if you're only hanging, you know, paneling on a wall, um, it's going to shrink your room a little bit, but sometimes it can end up being shrunk by feet at a time. Uh, also, you have to consider the aesthetic changes that might happen. Are you okay with losing a window? Are you okay with changing the style of door that you have? Are you okay with not having some of the amenities that the room originally came with because they make sound? So really, the last question is, how much are you willing to sacrifice in terms of the room itself? So now that we have those questions answered, or at least you're mindful of them so that you can go through these steps to see what those answers are going to be, uh, we can go ahead and jump into the steps that I recommend taking if you're going to be looking at a simple soundproofing project. <laughs> Now the first step is actually going to answer our first question, and it's this. Understand the type of sound that you're trying to eliminate. Now you may intuitively already know the sound that you're trying to address. You may actually already understand what it's going to take to fix it. Like, you know, maybe if it's that your son is practicing his bass in the garage, you know you're going to have to, you're going to, have to eliminate low frequencies. If the neighbor above you is walking and you can hear their footsteps, then you know pretty intuitively that you're going to have some impact noise that you're going to have to deal with. If it's the conversation in the room next to you, you might go, okay, I need to take care of the frequencies that are at speaking range, which you could just go out after the STC scale at that point. So basically, some things are intuitive, but some things are not, and so I recommend actually measuring them. There's a software out there called REW, or Room EQ Wizard, and it's free, and basically after you download it, you can use it to measure the sounds that are in your room. 
Basically, when you open the software, you go to this function here called RTA, and what it's going to do is you're going to see that there are um, different two different lines that are being made. So when I press record here, you'll see that I have a black line and a red line being made. Now, this black line is basically real-time the sound that is being picked up by the microphone on my computer. And so this is telling me that you can see that in this per, in this particular range here, I have higher sounds than in this particular range. So that means I would have to probably go after these low frequencies. Now you see here that this red line, what this is doing is this is actually recording the peaks. So as long as this is being recorded, it's going to show me on this red line um, the highest level that each of these frequencies was being played. So if you're looking at this graph, on the left side we're talking about low pitch frequencies, at the right side we're talking about high pitch frequencies. Now the x-axis here, up and down, this is telling us exactly how loud those sounds are. Okay, so you can see here that, um, you know, at 70 decibels, uh, I can see these low pitch frequencies are getting up there from um, this air conditioner that's running in the room. Okay, and so if I was going to have to address this, I would say, okay, I'm going to have to go after these low pitch frequencies, and I'm probably going to want to reduce them by about 20 decibels. Okay, and so that gives me a target for what I want to accomplish. Now, testing in your situation may change depending on what it is you're trying to do. Now, you might be able just to go ahead and test the sound directly, like if your son is playing video games in the next room, you can go ahead and just record it while he's playing video games, and you can see directly what you know the, the sound is actually causing. But sometimes it might not be something that you can actually schedule. Like, for example, let's say you work the graveyard shift and the garbage truck wakes you up. Um, you can actually set this up to record while you're sleeping, um, but the problem is you won't exactly know what that sound is that's actually getting to you. Um, you might say, okay, well, I know I have to go after this particular frequency, but I don't know what it is that's causing that, and that can be a factor in the point, point that I'm going to tell you about in just a little bit. You know, sometimes it can be a really good idea to test a variety of things. Maybe you want to set it up as you're sleeping uh, every day all week long, because if you are sitting there on Monday and you test it and it's like, okay, well, I don't really see anything, you know, that's any, that's particularly loud. And then you realize, oh, dang it, on Tuesday, that's when the garbage truck comes. Then you'll realize that you missed your opportunity to actually see what the sound is from that particular source. Um, it can also be a seasonal thing. Like, you know, maybe you're testing it um, in the winter and you don't realize that you get a low pitch hum from your air conditioner all during the summer. Or maybe you're recording it in the fall and you don't realize that sometimes there's a boiler noise that kicks off in the middle of the night that you don't want here you know so you know you can get as extensive with this or as you know pinpointed as you want but really remember the point is that you're trying to figure out what sounds you're trying to stop so keep that in mind as you're measuring the other thing I would say is to make sure that you're also measuring in different locations so if you're trying to prevent sound from getting out of your room you're going to want to test sound in you know multiple rooms around there so if I was going to test this room I'd also want to get sound samples from the stairway from the hallway uh, from the guest bedroom and maybe even over in the living room down here because that way I could see how the sounds in this room affect each individual room. The other thing is you also might want to try to figure out what sources might be. So if you're using a microphone, you can move that around the room, uh, or if you're just using your laptop, you can move it around the room and try to figure out, okay, am I hearing that garbage truck through the window, or am I hearing that garbage truck through the wall, or am I hearing it through the door? Because knowing where that sound comes from is really important. So again, the first thing you're going to want to know is where is that sound? coming from. Okay, so maybe if you're dealing with a garbage truck, it's like, okay, I know that this is coming in through the window, so I'm going to have to address the window because that's the weakest spot between me and the outside. And that information is going to help us with our second step, and that is identifying weak spots in the room. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do is try to figure out, like I said, where those sound sources are coming from. So I'll walk us through with a couple of different examples. So let's say in one example, you have a garbage truck that's outside and you know it's getting into your room, so you need to figure out what the weak spot is for it. Let's say in another example, in the room next to you, uh, someone is playing video games all night and you can hear the sounds from their video games coming from their computer speakers. And let's say as the third example, uh, you can hear some footsteps as people are walking over you frequently and it's driving you nuts. 
So now that we know where our sounds are coming from, we have to figure out how they're getting through our, the barrier between the rooms and into the place where we don't want them to be. There are three types of sounds that we're going to be looking for. We're looking for direct sound, which is basically sound that's working its way directly into your ear, basically powering its way through whatever kind of barrier you have. There's also flanking noise, and basically this is when the sound is able to find a way around the barrier. So let's say that you're sitting in a room, you put a three-foot concrete wall between you and a sound source, but sound is still getting to you because on the ceiling you have a half-inch sheet of drywall, and then on the other ceiling you have a half-inch sheet of drywall, and a wide-open attic space up above. Basically then the sound could go through that half-inch sheet of drywall and back down through the other half, so the sound only has to go through two half-inch sheets of drywall, without ever having to penetrate that three-foot concrete wall. So it works its way around any type of barrier that you might have. And then the last type of sound that we're talking about is impact noise. And basically this is the ability of a sound to vibrate through a structure. So if you put a barrier in between, and let's say it's framing with drywall, uh, the sound may actually start vibrating that, that drywall, and as the, the drywall and the framing vibrate, it transfers the sound through the solid source and into the next room. And so the only way to really stop that is to put an air gap between solid structures. Or also, I should mention that you could stop the vibration of the structure by dampening it or solidifying it as well. So for our example, let's say that we know that the garbage truck is getting to us because it's going through an old single pane window, and that sound vibrates right through it as direct sound. And then we'll say that the video games next to us are actually flanking noise because we'll say that there's an AC system and we have an HVAC vent above us and an HVAC vent in that room and the sound is actually traveling through the vent into the next room so we have flanking noise from the video games. And then the last example we'll say that the footsteps going overhead we know is impact noise because as somebody is walking on the floor above us it's vibrating the flooring, it's vibrating the subfloor, it vibrates the joists, it vibrates the drywall and as those are vibrating it transfers through and into our room. So for step three you're going to want to figure out how you're going to address those weak spots and you're going to make an overall plan. Now before you make this plan I highly recommend that you watch my video The Basics of Soundproofing because it gives a pretty general method for how to soundproof in general. Uh, but if you don't have time to watch that uh, I can give you just a quick rundown of the three things that you're going to do to try to soundproof. Basically the easiest way to remember it is the acronym DAM because you're trying to build a dam to prevent sound from coming in. So D-A-M. The D stands for decoupling and basically what that means is whenever you have solid structures that are vibrating, remember this is for impact noise you want to actually create an air gap there. So you separate the structure to make sure that that sound cannot vibrate from structure to structure to structure. Okay, so this is a really good way to prevent that by putting an air gap in between. So sometimes if you're building a room, you'll build a room within the room so that the walls are not touching the exterior walls. So you have an exterior wall that may be vibrating from sound like footprints or you know somebody hitting it with a hammer or something but then there's an interior wall that never actually makes physical contact with that wall. So the sound has to turn into physical vibration and then go back to air and then back to physical vi vibration, which diminishes the power of the sound wave. And so basically, decoupling is a great way to stop impact noise. So that's the D in DAM. Then we go to A. This is the air seal. This is a very important and often missed step. Remember that sound waves are trying to travel through the air. And so if there is any point between the room that you're in and the room that you don't want sound to be in, where there is an air connection, sound can travel through that. You might have a six foot thick concrete wall, but if you bore a hole through it, even a half an inch in diameter, sound will now work its way through that half inch hole and you and you will completely diminish a lot of your soundproofing qualities that used to be almost perfect with your six foot wall. The worst culprit when it comes to air gaps are doorways because basically in any room you have to be able to get into and out of it and so you need some type of a moving you know piece of the room to open so that you can walk in and out and so that immediately creates an air passage for sound to go through now of course you shut the door but doors are hardly ever sealed perfectly uh, and basically if you want to ever test this out in your own room uh, turn a light on and, and the outside portion of the door and then turn the light off in the room that you're in and watch how much light actually comes in. Anywhere you see light coming in through the door is an area for sound to get through. Uh, doors are also often very thin, flimsy and thin and hollow and that just creates more ways for sound to get through. So you might, you know, 
create this beautifully soundproof room um, and have sound just walking in very comfortably through the doorway, and it's almost a waste of effort. And finally, the most important thing that we have to wrap our minds around when it comes to soundproofing is using mass. Mass is very important. For some reason, we get this idea in our head that if we want to soundproof something, we need pillows and foam and soft things. But the truth is, that's not reality at all. Those are great for sound treatment within a room. It prevents you know, sound waves from bouncing around the room so the room sounds dead. But the sound waves will go right through it and into the next room. Uh, foam is actually really bad for soundproofing. So what we really want is mass. We want heavy stuff. We want concrete. We want brick. We want dense wood. We want things like that uh, that are going to actually stop sound waves from being able to go through them. So let's go ahead and make a plan for our imaginary room, and I'm going to take a look at some um, things that could potentially work to solve our problem. We know that we have a garbage truck outside and the sound is coming in through the window, and so one thing we're going to want to potentially consider is maybe sealing up that window a little bit if we have uh, you know, gaps around the outside edge or something like that. We could consider replacing the window with something that's not a single pane, maybe uh, you know, double paned with the argon gas in the middle or something like that. Um, maybe we want to get rid of the window completely and just totally brick over it and make it a, a solid wall. Or maybe we don't want to do that much, so instead we're going to build a plug that we could um, actually have this dense material that we put into the window to block everything out, and then when we want sunshine and there's no sound outside, we can go ahead and pull that plug out, which is something like I actually built in my studio. When it comes to the video game noise that we know is coming through our ventilation system, there's a few things we could do there as well. Uh, we could talk about completely getting rid of the HVAC system in that room or installing a mini split so it has its own AC system so there is no shared ventilation. Uh, or we could build a baffle, which is essentially a maze that you attach onto the ductwork so that the air will still be able to travel through the maze and get into the room. But every time the sound waves have to turn, they run into more sound absorbent material Material, which could really reduce the amount of sound that comes through. Or maybe we want something simpler. Maybe we want to keep our HVAC, but we don't want to spend a lot of money. And so you can get these little magnetic covers that we can put right over the top of the, the register when we don't want to hear the noise and we're not running the HVAC unit. And so that will actually give us an air seal so that we don't have that flanking noise coming in from the video games in the next room. So then when we think about the neighbors walking over us, we know that there's impact noise from their feet hitting the floor and vibrating through the structure of the building. Now, structural noise transfer is probably going to require a structural change to fix the problem. So we're probably talking about, you know, tearing out the drywall and hanging some resilient channel. Uh, resilient channel instead of allowing the joists that are running across the floor to completely touch the drywall. Um, it actually separates the drywall from the joist and the only place where there's actually contact that goes all the way through uh, is just at the intersecting points here. Uh, and so that actually, you know, reduces quite a bit the amount of impact noise that comes through. Or maybe we don't want to drop any more into the room than we have to, so what we decide to do is we can actually uh, rigidify, is that a word, rigidify? solidify, whatever, make the joy stronger because we know that they're vibrating. So one thing we could do is put some extra wood in between to kind of prevent them from getting, you know, some vibration going. Uh, maybe if we had access to the subfloor up above, uh, we could eliminate things like creaking and stuff like that by shooting some screws through the floor uh, because if the nails are starting to come out and that allows the floor to move, that allows vibration to transfer and creaking to happen. And so if you screw them down tight, that's less of an opportunity for them to vibrate. Um, maybe you could even attach, if you have a joist going this way, you could actually attach another joist next to it because as the joists are kind of sw you know swinging like this, that's vibration as well. So adding more to you know make it a little more rigid prevents it from vibrating as well. Um, and actually, the only way to really prevent impact noise in a way that isn't going to be some kind of a structural change is something that you're probably not going to get a lot of great results with. But it is possible, like you could add carpeting upstairs or put an area rug in the pathway or something like that, assuming you have access to that particular unit. If your neighbors above you are not willing to work with you, you know, you don't own the place and you can't go in their house and make changes, it's going to be a lot harder for you to figure out what to do underneath without actually doing something to the drywall. 
And that brings us to step four, and that's comparing your ideas to your budget. Now, that's not just financial. Remember, I said that it matters about the space that you want to put in, the work that you want to put in, the aesthetic changes that might be required. And so you have to kind of consider those things. So let's say, you know, you're thinking about the garbage truck in the window and it's like, you know what? I, I really don't want to spend a lot of money by replacing the windows. Um, I, my wife wouldn't let me brick it over because it'll totally make the outside and inside of our house different. And we like the sunlight there. Um, but I really only don't want to hear the garbage truck when I'm sleeping, when I'm working on night shift. And so maybe the best solution in that case would be, okay, I'm going to build a window plug. It's just, you know, a couple sheets of plywood, maybe some insulation, uh, finding a way to hook it up to the window. Uh, I used these... Um, uh, workbench, you know, um, I don't know what they're called, but basically you just like clamp it down and it locks wood down on the work workbench and stuff like that. And you just use that to hold it in the window. Uh, when you want the sunlight to come in, you just pop that open and pull it out and you're, you're wide open. So that might be the best solution in that case. As for the video games, maybe you're going to think, well, you know what? I really don't have the money to put in a mini split unit. Um, I can't afford to, I don't want to build a baffle cause I'm not really handy. So I'm just going to go ahead and get a magnetic register cover and put it up there. Um, and then I'm going to talk to my son and I'm going to tell him that I don't want him playing video games at certain hours, or I'm going to tell him to turn off his, his subwoofer after nine o'clock so that it's just the high pitch noises, which, um, diminish a lot quicker than low pitch noises. You know, so there's ways to use creativity to kind of eliminate things as well. And finally, thinking about the impact noise, if you're close with your neighbors, you could say, hey, you know what, in this one spot, it's really bad. If I bought you an area rug, uh, would you be okay with putting that down there? Um, and if they're cool, then, you know, that, that could help eliminate some of the footstep noise. Um, but maybe the best solution, you know, maybe you're handy and you're, you're willing to take down the drywall. Uh, so just pull down those sheets, put some res channel up there, maybe some, uh, you know, insulation up in there, maybe even hang some mass loaded vinyl. Mass loaded vinyl is a great way to add mass as well. Um, put that in there, uh, hang some resilient channel. Um, and hang it with the clips because uh, with Resilient Channel, you can screw the channel directly into the joist, but there's still contact there where it's touching the joist. But they have clips that actually put like a rubber isolation in between the res channel and the joist, and that would help even more. And so uh, that could help to significantly reduce the, the footsteps as well. And then, you know, maybe put in a couple of, uh, you know, cross boards in between the joist there to help stop some vibration. Um, throw up some five eighths inch drywall. Maybe, you know, they only used half inch on the ceiling and it's really thin and that's why noise is getting through. So you add some five eighths inch, maybe even a second layer of five eighths inch drywall. Um, and that could really help to reduce a lot of those footsteps as well. And the fifth step is simply executing your plan, getting it done. Um, so basically up until this point, we know that we have identified the noises that we're trying to eliminate. We figured out what the weak spots are that we're going to have to go after. Uh, we've made a plan. We've compared it to our budget, which is more than just money. It's also our, our time and our labor and the changes to the room and things like that. And then finally you execute it. So it can really, the process is that simple, but the more challenging part is just how each of those steps breaks down. So I hope that you found this video helpful. I appreciate that you took the time to watch it. Um, I hope that it wasn't discouraging, but instead it was encouraging to know that there are solutions out there. Some of them can be complicated, but other solutions might just need more creativity. If you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider liking it and subscribing to my channel because this is the type of stuff I love to tackle. And with that, I hope that you have a great day and I will see you on the next video.